It is uh, awesome to be here. Um, when I was 17 years old, God gave me a dream that one day I'd preach on this platform. No, it wasn't that. That I'd be part of building the church. And um, over the last 20 odd years, um, this auditorium and a lot of the people I look at sitting to the sides before I've been a part of Hillsong, you guys were like such an integral part of kind of the journey. I feel like getting emotional already. And uh, I just want to honor all of you and say it's an incredible privilege to be here, built on the back of your guys' faithfulness. And if you're in here today, it doesn't matter if you've been here 10 minutes or 100 years, um, or 40 odd years, actually, 100 would be impossible. Um, I'm really grateful for all that you as a church family at our Hills campus have done, reaching and influencing Australia. And there are so many things, you are trailblazers, so many things that I've done because I've copied off many of the people here. So a massive thank you and honor. It's an honor to be here. Thank you, Phil. Thank you, Jay, who um, put me down as well, but he knows what my preaching's like, so he booked a flight to Melbourne um, as well. But we are family. My family is in Greater Springfield at the moment. Now that I actually have a new title that Phil didn't mention, it's husband to the campus pastor, and uh, they are going to take Greater Springfield to Greater Springfield. Can I get an amen? But uh, I would like to meet my family. They're not here, but I do have a picture of them, okay? So this is my family. That's my wife, Crystal, on the side, campus pastor, also my boss on a Sunday. That's my daughter, Sabella. She's 13 um, with the wisdom of a 45-year-old. Uh, and on the right is my son, Ezekiel, who's just started learner driving, which is awesome. And, uh, and we've now been married. We celebrated our anniversary in June this year. We've now been married for six years. So really stoked. I'm, I'm kidding, guys. I'm kidding. We've been married like 18 years. I was just doing like a religious check just to see what the vibe of the room was. You guys passed. No one scoffed except for Tyler. He was like, what? Get this guy off the stage. But um, anyway, it's awesome to be here. Should we pray? Jesus, we thank you that you're with us and we thank you you're here. And we pray that you would speak to us tonight, God. We just want to meet with you. We want to encounter you. And uh, would you challenge us and change us in your name? Amen. You guys can sit down, have a seat. If you're a New Zealander here, the memory of the Broncos lost to the Panthers, out of all teams you can lose to, like the Panthers, um, is still raw in my heart, so I stand with you in solitude. Um, we're in the middle of talking to this idea of healthy, whole, and holy in October. And uh, I actually had this thought as we look at healthy, whole, and holy, like where does wholeness come from? Like as we navigate out through life, where does it come from? Maybe you're in here and you know someone who searched for wholeness in the wrong place. Like uh, as the wise old preacher would say, two half people don't make a full person. That's right, that's good wisdom. Uh, maybe you've seen people chase it in relationships. I'm a really competitive guy personally, like achieving stuff, like doing stuff. And uh, who knows, sometimes competitive people will try to find wholeness in like what they do and their accomplishments. We're going to have a look at the moment uh, in Philippians chapter 3. We're just going to live in Philippians chapter 3 for the next um, few moments. And we're going to look at what Paul has to say about wholeness and where we find wholeness from. But to understand Paul and wholeness, I think we've got to understand a little bit about who Paul is. Paul wasn't like the other disciples. The other disciples, they had a more interesting route to following Jesus and being disciples of Jesus, who was a rabbi at the time. Paul was different. Paul was like one of the elite of the elite. Like Paul, he, uh, he trained under one of the most well-known um, scholars of the day, Gamaliel. Lee? Hey? We got it. I call it Galileo Galileo, but they tell me that that was a different rabbi um, <laughs> from Bohemian Rhapsody. So he, he travels under this guy. I want you to think for a moment. If I was to hop up here and say, you know who personally mentors me in the Christian faith world? I want you to think of a name. Like that name that would make you go, oh man, Midson, he must be a pretty good guy. That is the guy that Paul or Saul at the time trains under. Saul was also had this unique heritage where he was, uh, his parents were Roman and Jew, which gave him special privileges. And we actually see Saul, who becomes Paul, he elevates his way through this world like quite quickly. He becomes very influential. We read about him in Acts chapter 6 and 7 where his influence actually becomes like impressive. Just Saul had a mission and then he encounters Jesus and Jesus like reshapes and reforms his whole purpose in life. And now we find Paul has a mission. And now Paul is writing at, at the, a latter point in his life to the church in Philippians 
To understand Philippians 3, we've got to both understand Paul, but we've got to also understand the town of Philippi. Um, I've got three G's for you. I'm a simple man from Ipswich. All of my uh, schooling was rhyming, so we've got three G's. I want everyone to say gold, glory, and gods. This is my very simple attempt, and if any of this is wrong, then um, I'm sure someone can correct it later. But Philippi was known as a town for gold. It was wealthy. It had all these mines around it. They actually used it. Rome used it to further their military campaign. But Philippi was different. I want you to think about like a city that you would move into an area to say that you lived in that city. In Brisbane or Queensland, it's Ipswich. It might be like... It might be like Kellyville or Blacktown, Wollongong with its scenic beaches, the real epicenter of New South Wales. This is kind of what Philippi was. See, Philippi was set up to be a little Rome. That's what they called it. So there were all these privileges of part of living in this province. There were things like uh, they didn't have to pay taxes. Who thinks that's a good deal? Yeah, when you pay taxes, you realize that's a good deal. It was also jam-packed full of a whole heap of leftover soldiers who um, Caesar Augustus at the time put in there who were known for like their military prowess. So there's this sense where this town is full of this sense of glory and elitism. Not only is it an elite town, it's full of elite soldiers. But then it's also known for its gods. We have the earliest creed in our faith is one written by Paul, which is simply the letters, Jesus is Lord. Uh, The guy who ruled over Rome at the time, Caesar Augustus, he also had a saying that was Caesar is Lord. So when Jesus rolls onto the scene and he says, and and the disciples start saying Jesus is Lord, this flies like directly in the face of what the Roman government's trying to teach you at the time. So it's like a controversial statement to start with. But there was this idea that Caesar had almost established himself in a town in Philippi where they worshipped many, many gods. There was almost like this godlike quality. So to quote like the uh, Scarface equivalent at the time, first you get the gold, then you get the glory, and then you, I don't know, become a god or something like that. So Paul is writing to these people. Paul himself, who has been a rabbi of rabbis, is now writing to a town that considers himself to be elite and prestigious. Okay, you with me? And now we pick up in Philippians chapter 3. Further, brothers and sisters, rejoice in the Lord, which sidebar, Paul is in prison when he writes this. Like, I've written more depressing text messages when the Broncos lost. And Paul writes a letter in prison, and what does he say? Rejoice in the Lord. It is no trouble for me to write the same things to you again. It's a safeguard for you. And then he kind of flicks tone and he says, watch out for those dogs, those evil doers. Like we think like uh, my daughter's trying to convince us at the moment to buy like a Labradoodle or something, like a little small dog that can go in our home. And um, this is not when Paul's writing this, we think of like domestic dogs. Paul's using this really aggressive language describing like a wild ravenous dog in the street or a a Panthers supporter as well. And um, he says, watch out for them. Those mutilators of the flesh, for it is we who are the circumcision, we who serve God by his spirit, who boast in Christ Jesus and put no confidence in the flesh, though I I myself have reasons to do so. It's like Paul's writing to this group of religious elite, pause for two seconds, similar to the book of Galatians, who are coming and saying this, like, yeah, it's all good, like, you can worship Jesus and you can follow him, but you don't find full wholeness just in Christ or in Jesus, you got to do all of this other stuff on top of it. And that's where like Paul's writing like so aggressively saying, man, you got to watch out for these guys like you would watch out for a dog in a street. My first job was delivering junk mail and I literally got attacked by a dog. Like, I know, it's very sad. I'm like, I'm not, I mean this no word of a lie. I was running the other day. I had like my noise cancelling, whatever, headphones in. And I heard a bark from behind me. And it's like all the trauma of the nine-year-old me who got bitten on the kneecap came back. And I like jumped and I'm doing the dance. And I look behind and it's like, a, it, obviously it's a tiny dog. But <laughs> Paul's writing in that kind of way to say, hey, be alert. Even though I have comfort, I have reasons to be confident in myself. He's saying, don't do that. I just want to pause and say this. One of the themes of Philippians is this outrageous joy. You will never find joy while you think you are self-righteous. I think legalism, it destroys joy and actually creates what I think is the opposite of wholeness, which is brokenness. 
it, it's hard to be joyful when you think you're earning your salvation. Yeah. And what will happen is you will often switch between pride or shame between the two. This is a quote from Shannon Adler. You will never overcome your self-righteousness if you continue to believe that God prefers you over other people. The moment you feel entitled is the moment you feel superior and distance yourself from a humble heart that believes God knows what he is doing. So Paul says, man, I don't put any confidence in what I do. And then he goes on to say this, if anyone thinks they have reasons to put confidence in the flesh, well, I've got more. Circumcised on the eighth day, the people of Israel, the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of Hebrews, in regard to the law, a Pharisee, as for zeal, persecuting the church, as for righteousness based on the law, faultless. It's like what Paul does for a moment, thanks to the youth department. I tried to bring trophies through uh, customs, but uh, there was a New South Welshman there, and he had a look at it, and he did not recognize what a trophy looks like. So he, um, Paul unveils, so I rehearsed that about four times, just to... <laughs> Paul unveils what is Paul's trophy cabinet. Now, for Paul, his list is a little bit weird. It's like Benjamin and Benjamin, Hebrews of Hebrews, you know, goes into all sorts of details on the rituals that he's been through. I, f I found this, though, like Paul is listing and saying, you don't find wholeness in these things. I don't have any of those struggles. My name is Midson, born of Stephen and Robin Midson, born in the mighty town of Ipswich, um, baptized when I was 12. Like, it doesn't feel... But I have my own trophies. Okay, I won't peel back the curtain for two seconds. I'm not a campus pastor anymore, so I have obviously elevated from such petty things as comparing my weekend attendance and holding it up like a trophy in front of other people. But I'll tell you, like, there are a lot of other people, myself included, who find a lot of value in how many people come to church on a Sunday. Maybe for you, if you were to unveil your trophy cabinet, maybe yours is, have you seen my son and what he does at sport? Oh, I tell you, little Billy, under 11s. He's got a real future in mixed netball. Like, this kid, he's going to make it. Big dreams written on his life. Like, or maybe for you, it's like every person you meet, uh, this isn't anyone here at all, every person you meet, would you like my number? I'll give you a business card. No, no, just I'll put the number in my phone. No, you need my business card because it has my title under it. My first business card said youth pastor. Still a, still a trophy to be proud of, isn't it, Tyler? It is, it is, reaching a generation. Or maybe for you it's like, it's like relationships. Like I know this, like you have your trophies. You've got your things because I know this, I have my things. I have my things that I wheel out to say, this is where I find wholeness from. This is where I find completion from. Like, isn't it, isn't it funny? This is just a parenting thing that I've found. It's amazing how much of my wholeness is wrapped up in how good a job I think I'm doing as a parent. It, it, like, sometimes, like, my kids are probably listening, best kids in the world, but, but sometimes, sometimes when, when they have, like, maybe naughty behavioral moments. I'm actually less concerned about them having naughty behavioral moments, and sometimes I'm more concerned about how I look as a parent as a result. But you've, you've got yours. Maybe it's executive in front of your job. Maybe it's, maybe it's the career promotion you're chasing. Maybe, maybe for you it's a relationship that you're in. Maybe it's like, maybe you're good at Instagram and it's followers and stuff like that. I don't know what yours are, but I know this. I know our bias as humanity is to try to find wholeness in the things that we do. Paul himself, he, he like alludes to this. He says, like, man, I have got all of the reasons. Remember, he was different than the disciples. He was supremely qualified. He says, I have every reason. I have every reason to have confidence in myself and to find wholeness. And then he says in this, verse 7, but whatever were gains to me, I now consider a loss. My wife looks after all of our accounting and finances. I'm a mature enough and, and whole enough man to do what she says with our money. But he's using here like an accounting term. It's like he's writing in one column and he goes, all of my achievements and trophies, like all of the profit and loss, puts it all in the Excel spreadsheet. It's like, you know, like for him, like 
I know this much of the Bible. I'm, I attend this often. I've attained this level of uh, service. I've got this level of career. I've got you know, this relationship. I've got, this is what people think. This is what my kid's school looks like. This is what university I go to. He puts all of them in and he says, at the end of the column, when you work all the little Excel stuff out and press that backwards E button, it all works out as a loss. A loss compared to what? A loss compared to the sake of Christ. For what I consider a loss, what, I, what is more, I consider everything a loss for the surpassing worth of knowing Christ, Jesus my Lord, for whose sake I've lost all things. In fact, he then goes a step further and he says, I consider them garbage. It's like Paul gets all of the stuff that we would go, this is where I find my wholeness and worth and this is where I find all of this. And he's like listing, he's like, guys, in a town that's obsessed with gold, glory and gods, in a place where it's like, man, you've got to live here and then you, you've got to live a certain way and you can, like, you can find wholeness in this. And Paul goes, man, here are all of my personal accomplishments. He writes a totally countercultural message and he says, not only does it equal a loss, but he says, in fact, beyond that, I actually consider them all garbage now compared to knowing Christ. The actual word there that he uses, it's, it's like a crass term. It's not just garbage. It's like a vulgar term. It's like Paul's expressing, like compared to knowing Jesus, I don't find wholeness in any of this stuff. Like compared to knowing him, but the interesting part about the word know there is it's not knowledge. So he's not writing and saying, you know, it's all garbage compared to the knowledge of Christ. It's not, it, it's not like an intellectual idea that he's writing about. He's not writing and saying, hey, what is more? If you just know enough. The word know that he uses here, this is like a PG service. Um, Alan's and Keeley just got married. Who knows they had knowledge of each other before? They know each other. What's her favorite color, Alan's? <laughs> oh, great, all right. <laughs> what have I done? Guys, we've made a mistake. What's something you know? We were married. <laughs> we were married. What's one thing you know about her? She's whispering. Like, she loves chocolate, okay? He knows that, right? What's, what's something about Alan's, Kelly? He's a morning person. Ugh. <laughs> See, they know each other. They have a knowledge of each other. But you guys got married a month ago, six weeks ago? Like the Bible's two weeks ago? Two months ago. Time flies when you're in bliss. Um, the word know there is different. The word know there is they knew each other. But now, as the Bible describes, they know each other. It's like, it's like a term of intimacy. It's like, it, it's like the highest form of intimacy. Like when Adam knew his wife, Right? So what, what Paul is saying is he says, man, all this stuff that you think makes you whole, man, compared to the intimacy of knowing Christ, it all goes in the garbage, pals in comparison. And here's, here's why it matters. We actually don't change our lives based on what we know. Like, I kn I'll give you like a live example. I know that I'm 38 years old. I know that my metabolism is on an uphill climb. I know that after this service, I don't need to eat dinner, because I had a snack, I had a, some food before we came. I know that I should not go out for wings with Tyler. I know that. Guys, I love wings. <laughs> we change our lives around what we love. Hands up if you're a parent here. Okay, who knows? that it is recommended that you get eight hours of uninterrupted sleep in a night. <laughs> who knows that? You know that. But who knows that when little Billy, next year for you guys, Alan and Keely, <laughs> multiply. Um, who knows that when you hear the cry come from the other room, knowledge goes out the window because of what you love. So, so Paul is saying, and this is where it's crazy, Paul is saying, you can spend your whole life chasing this stuff. But compared to falling in love with Jesus, knowing him, knowing him. Man, all this stuff is garbage. And we all know someone who spent their life chasing this. Some of you know fathers in here who spent their whole life chasing trophies. 
Like we've heard stories of different pastors who chased their whole life leaving their kids. It's one of the great challenges for, for us that I don't know if we always get right, but I, I, I never want to be chasing the acclaim of people at the sacrifice of my family. But we know people who've chased wholeness and relationships as a trophy. And all that's left them to, everyone, everyone can see what's happening around it. Chased fame, chased career, chased title. Like we know people who've done this. And Paul is going, man, it, it, like, guys, like compared to knowing Christ, and then he goes on to say this, I want to know him, know the power of his resurrection, participate in his suffering with him. This is one of the unique things about Christianity, right? Like this is what John Stott in his book, Authentic Christianity, says. He says, union with Christ is a unique emphasis among the world's religion. No other religion claims to offer its adherents a personal union with its founder. The Buddhist does not claim to know Buddha, the Confucius Confucius or the Muslim Mohammed or the Marxist Karl Marx, but the Christian does claim, humbly I hope, and nevertheless confidently, to know Jesus Christ. This is like my simple challenge for us in here. Where do we find wholeness? Man, it's not in any of this stuff. It's not in any of it. Like the, some of this stuff, you know, the hard thing is some of this stuff's good. It's not bad. Like some of this stuff's good, but, but the, pursuit, the pursuit of our affection needs to be in knowing Christ, pursuing Him, not in pursuing this other stuff to find wholeness instead. But this, this is the crazy part of what happens when you, when you allow your life to be transformed and you pursue Christ with everything. This is what Paul says. He, he says this. He's, like, I'll, I'll run it through again. He says, if anyone has confidence for all their trophies, I've got even more, but I consider it garbage, worthless. And you could read this as though Paul now, who was highly ambitious, right? Paul, who was out there, key part of the stoning of Stephen, like going to the, the, the council at the time and saying, let me loose on the disciples. Like Saul, who's doing all of these things, highly ambitious, that then when he becomes a Christian, it's like he becomes anesthetized to all of this stuff. You can read it that way, but, but this is the great, he says, like I know all of that, it's garbage compared to knowing Christ. And when you know Christ, you tra like he transforms the very way you live and all the priorities that you have. But this is the bit that's crazy about all of this is then he says in verse 12, just a quick refresher, where is Paul? He's writing to Philippi, he's in prison. Like he's in prison. I don't think, Bible college, correct me if I'm wrong, I don't think he ever saw freedom again. He may have, didn't, did. It's debatable, okay, guys, that's all that matters. But, but Paul's writing this in prison and you know what he writes? He doesn't say, I'm just going to sit contemplatively in my lifestyle and be settled with what I have now. He actually writes the opposite. He says, not that I have already obtained this or arrived at my goal, but I press on to take hold. I press on to take hold that of which Christ Jesus took hold to me. Brothers and sisters, I do not consider myself to have yet taken hold, but I forget what is behind and I strain ahead. I press forwards towards the goal to win the prize for which God has called me heavenward in Jesus Christ. The worship team, you guys can join me um, now. So what Paul does is he writes this and he says, man, you can chase all of this stuff, but what happens is when you pursue God, something happens within the heart of every person. He actually uses a phrase in another translation. He says, I run towards the upwards call of Jesus. It's like, I'm never gonna find wholeness in this. Never gonna find, but when I love God, he actually explodes my imagination for what he can do with someone who will pursue him. So much so that I'm filled with a high and holy ambition, as John Stott would say. This is what Thomas Merriton says, as the magnifying glass concentrates the rays of the sun into a tiny burning knot of heat that can set fire to a dry leaf or a piece of paper. So the mystery of Christ concentrates the rays of God's light and fire to a point that it sets fire to the spirit of a man. And then Tom Stott, uh, John Stott says this, high and holy ambition to be a saint is not opposed to holy humility. It's a total reliance on God's grace. Exactly the opposite. Ambition without humility is ambition that's fouls. It's pride. Humility without ambition is false humility. We just did Sermon on the Mount. 
Matthew 6, 33, seek first the kingdom of God. Like sometimes we read that like a list of priorities. It's like I got to start seek God on Sunday and then I'll order my life around it. Or, or I'll read my Bible in the morning and then I'll, you know, get to my smoothie or my shake, you know, go to the work, whatever from there. The way that that's actually written is this idea of if you picture like a throne room, like you walk in and at the center throne, if I had a seat, I'd sit in it. At the center of this throne is where King Jesus sits. The idea of seeking first is that everything in my life arranges itself around this throne. So when Paul writes and he says, hey, like, I forget what's behind, he's saying, I've aligned everything in my life around the king. Right, if the Sermon on the Mount for two seconds is a new kingdom ethic, it means that we don't serve the kings of this world. It means we serve another king. It means we serve his agenda. He sits on the throne. How do you know that someone is part of this kingdom of God? Because our whole allegiance is to the king who sits here. He doesn't give us recommendations. We serve at the pleasure of the king. But what happens is we don't chase meaningless stuff like I don't know if this is just me but I feel like I'm I'm done chasing trinkets I feel like I'm done chasing things that don't matter there is a king and he gives us a mandate it says in 2 Corinthians 5 20 it says we are therefore Christ's ambassadors he makes his appeal through us Come back to Jesus. Like we need a church not chasing trinkets. We got to be a church filled with a sense of calling that says, it's your kingdom come. Your will be done. Not, not, not just in a church service, but as I go from here. And then watch what happens when you, when you instead fix your eyes on Jesus. Like He will soil you for anything else in the world. Nothing else will satisfy no achievement, no acclaim. And the goal is not a once-off encounter with God. The goal is that we would daily fall in love with Jesus again and watch as He reorientates and this gets further and further away. And instead it's like, God, I just want everything that You have for me. And that is where wholeness comes from. I love the story of the thief on the cross. I feel like it's put in there just to mess with me for a moment. Like there's, there's two thieves next to Jesus. One of them is mocking him. The other one says, remember me. I love this story because the thief on the cross doesn't do any of the things that I think God needs me to do. He doesn't sit up there and go, Jesus, I promise if I get out of this situation, I am never gonna look at that again. I promise you. I'm going to break up with this. I'm going to do this. I'm going to do that. I promise you, I'm going to get. He didn't go to church. He didn't go to connect group. He didn't serve on a team. You should totally do all those things because they're awesome as well. But instead, he just accepted something that Jesus gave him. I'd love to invite us to stand to our feet. Paul rearranged his whole life around Jesus. He has this incredible encounter with God rearranges his whole life. Like, isn't that a little bit what God did in rearranging heaven to send Jesus for us? And what we see is Paul filled with this sense, he's in prison writing, I am not finished, I'm just getting started. That'd be my hope. We need more young and young men and women, passionate, sold out for the cause of Jesus, like declaring like, I will not chase anything else. I'm not looking for wholeness in any other area. Like instead, I just want what God has for me. And when we come in here, it, 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 in my heart, it's like, a, it's like a reminder and a fill up point to say, God, it's your kingdom. It's your will. It's your way. And watch what happens. Watch as no longer do you find wholeness in this, but instead from a place of acceptance, watch as God uses our generations mightily. So I'd love, the team's gonna lead us in worship. And 
I hope that this challenges you more tomorrow than it does today. I, I hope that this challenges us tomorrow morning as we wake up. Like how are we reorientating our life, focusing it, pushing it towards God? How are we allowing Him to challenge us and change us? And how are we being stirred by Him? Can we lift our hands in this place? Can we worship Jesus? We thank You that You are with us. We thank You, Your King, God. We remind ourselves, God, that You sit on the throne in this moments that we have together. We choose to reorientate our lives and put You at the centre place. We pray, Spirit of God, would You speak to us tonight? Would You fill our hearts with a sense of vision, God? Would You, God, for those who feel like they've got to achieve and do something to experience grace from You, would You instead replace it just with an unconditional, unwavering grace, God? For those who feel a little lost in their journey, I pray that You'd speak fresh vision, God. Speak fresh inspiration, God. Speak to us in these moments, we pray. Come on, let's worship for a minute.
in a, in a moment, we are going to continue to worship and really believe God's going to do something great. This is a specific kind of word I got when I was praying about here. Six months ago, I did step into a new role, and um, I'd like to think that uh, I didn't chase any of my achievements and acclaim in other stuff, and uh, the first Sunday that I was back at the Springfield campus after it had been announced that Crystal was going to be the campus pastor, I, uh, I walk into the foyer. I want, to, I want to say I was a bigger man than this story. I walk into the foyer, and first volunteer sees me and goes, ah, you're here. We don't have to listen to you anymore. I want to say I responded maturely and said, oh, my child, of course, it was all for the Lord. I lay it before him. But instead, I think I made a joke about spending the rest of the budget and any decisions go, comma, cafe's free. And then I walked outside and my good friend Guy Warner is here today. And uh, he saw me, he goes, you look a little frustrated. And I said, I'm like more irritated by this than I should be. Like, I'm like proper irritated. I'm like, I'm starting to rant at Guy. I'm like, do they know how much I've bled for these people, sacrificed for these people, how hard I've worked? You know, all I'm doing. These are all my trophies. These are all the things I did. Are they gonna give me approval? Are they gonna thank me? Is Crystal gonna thank me for all the work I did here? She doesn't need to, the lid's off the campus, greatest here we come. I went home that afternoon. I wanna say like I was an obedient person with God, but it, it like took me a minute to get over myself. Why? So much wholeness had come from this. This is, this is the challenge of this verse. There's good stuff. Like there's good stuff that you have done. There's good stuff you've been involved in. There's good ministries. There's good careers. There's good achievements, good things. I forget what's behind. Springfield is the greatest campus in the world. If I talk about it longer, I'll get like, but it was never mine. I'm not any better when it goes good or bad. And this is like my challenge. I forget some of this. It doesn't mean it was bad. It doesn't mean it was wrong. It doesn't mean it, but I forget it because it wasn't mine. And I press on. And, and for some of us in here, when there's uncertainty, and that's just in humanity, we rush for this stuff. I gotta hoard my trophies, guys. It's, it's human nature. I hope as we declare this, we sing Jesus over our cities. We sing Jesus over our families. We sing Jesus over this church, over our campuses. It'll be a forget what is behind. And on both hands, I'm both hands pushing on into the future. And watch what God does. Some of you in here, I believe this, He's gonna birth supernatural stuff in your hearts. You're gonna be stirred even tomorrow with what He can do. So can we lift our hands? And for some of us, it's a grieving process of letting go. But I wanna say the things God has are so much better ahead of us. Can we worship one more time? Sing this prophetically. Come on, let's shout Jesus over this region. Shout Jesus from the mountains. Jesus in the streets. Jesus in the dark.
We take a moment in all our services to pray for people who do not have a personal relationship with God. And maybe you're in here tonight, and as you hear everything, I wanna, I wanna say this, the first step in wholeness, the very first step, comes in accepting the forgiveness that Jesus gave us. Maybe you're in here tonight and you don't have a personal relationship with God, or maybe you're not following Him. Maybe a friend or a family member brought you in, Maybe it's your first time to church. Maybe you've been coming to church for a long time. I think heaven's great invitation is that we would accept the forgiveness found only in Christ. And you can do a whole heap of other stuff for God, but it will never take the place of the gift of salvation that He gives us. And if you're in here tonight, maybe you don't have a personal relationship with Him, we'd actually love as a church family, we'd be honored to pray with you. So we're all going to bow our heads. We're all going to close our eyes. And if that's you, if you're in here, I'd love for you just to put a hand on your heart, lift your hands to heaven, grab the hand of the person next to you, give it a squeeze, just so they know that this moment you're responding to the gospel, the good news that Jesus came and we can find forgiveness and hope in Him. And we are all going to, as one church family, we're going to pray together. So let's pray. Dear Jesus, thank you that you came and made a way for me. I ask you to forgive me of all the things I've done that should come into my life and into my heart as my Lord, Saviour and Teacher from this moment on. In your name I pray. Amen. And this is, yeah, we're going to celebrate because that is the best decision you can make. But this, this is what we'd love for you to do. We would love to give you a gift. We'd love to give you a Bible. We'd love to pray with you. We'd love to get a chance to call you this week to get some details. I just believe our faith journey is best walked out in community. It was never something that was meant to be done alone. So it'd be our honour if after this service we'll have guys uh, waving Bibles around. If you were to go up to them and, and you, this is the great part. You don't even need to say anything fancy. You just look at them. They'll know what it means. They'll give you this because they're stoked, as are we, that you chose to do this. Why don't we celebrate those people one more time?